coming to you from the Paranormal Warehouse, Destination Mystery paints the story for paranormal content, abnormal adventures, and the fun behind the investigations. Each week, Mike and Melissa will bring a new adventure that includes going to some of the most remote places in the West. They will tell the story behind the investigation and share with you the evidence they discover. This is not your regular paranormal show. These episodes will bring new content from locations that no one would think to investigate or explore. We will not only tell the spooky story, we will go to the location where the spooky story originated. Fasten your seatbelts as we take you on an adventure that will make you question what's normal and what's paranormal. Okay, welcome all you paranormal peeps and weird wanderers. We are excited to be back. We are Destination Mystery and this is our third um, episode on the Paranormal Warehouse. Um, I'm Melissa with Ghost Girl Memoirs. Mike with Paranormal Treasure Hunter. And together we are Destination Mystery. If you missed last week's episode, it is on our Facebook page. You can also scroll through um, and see last week's episodes on the Paranormal Warehouse, but it was a pretty good one. It's one of our favorites. It was about a murderer whose name was Joseph Loveless, and he was found in a cave um, pretty much in pieces. Uh, part of him was found in the 70s, and the other part of it was, was found in the 90s, and they just barely recently discovered who he was, and we told the story behind that. And still haven't he, found his head, though. Nope, no head, so we're still looking for that. Um, we'll probably go back and do another investigation to see if he'll talk to us. And, um, tell us where his head is. Tell us. We want to know where his head is, and we want to know who murdered him. Those are still the yeah. two biggest... Um, Mysteries. These unresolved mysteries, yes. But we did capture some evidence from that investigation and we shared it last week. So if you want to go back and view it, it's a pretty exciting episode. Um, we want to do a couple of thank yous real quick. We want to thank Tyler for our music, uh, Cosette for our trailer, for taking our weird videos and making them look, making us look cooler than we really are. Um, Mark for our logo. We want to thank Sierra, Lauren, Taylin, Bella, Hobbs, and Curtis with Paranormal Teens for going on our adventures with us. Uh, we want to thank Michelle with Time Forgotten for being our photographer and also helping out with our investigations. Um, and then we want to thank our spouses and others um, in our lives that put up with our weirdness and the fact that we only ever talk about weird stuff. That's all, that's all I want to talk about. So It's more fun. We appreciate those who still um, allow us into their homes and, <laughs> and let, allow us to hang out with them, even though... shunned us completely. Yeah. Yeah. Even though we're weird, that's okay. Um, and then we want to... Um, we want to let you know that this will be a family show. We don't curse on this show. Sometimes there is a, a bit of a spooky story. But um, if you're okay with your kids watching that, they should, they'll be fine to watch this show. We take all of our kids on our investigations. And Lauren's the youngest. How old are you? 13. She's 13. So. Yep. And they have a great time. Um, what is the name we have her online name? Uh, I don't know if she has an online name. but well, I the named, one we were going to use. I named her the Idaho Rake Chaser. Um because I swear something spooky happens every time she comes. She seems to summon them. She does. <laughs> um, and Michael has even captured kind of a weird picture. That was just a couple of weeks ago while she was there with us. And I don't know how I got it, but that's a couple of weird pictures. I don't know how I got, but. But yeah. of all the spooky ones that we've done, um, she's been there. Yeah. <laughs> the rest of them haven't been too terribly bad, so. It's okay, Lauren. That's what we like. That's uh, part of the, the thrill, I guess. Um, we want to thank our sponsors, Cash Valley Endocrine and Family Medicine, for keeping us in uh, good health and taking care of us so we can go on these adventures. We want to thank the Idaho Falls Plumbing Company and also Idaho Falls Diesel. Uh, keeps Michael's truck running and all of his other four-wheelers, ATVs, uh, snowmobiles all that kind of stuff Much everything yep they do a really good job um 
Oh, we still have some sponsor spots available. If you're interested, you can go to our webpage at destination-mystery.com and there'll be information there. You can email us from there if you're interested. You'll get a, a commercial that goes out to um, thousands of viewers on the Paranormal Warehouse. And then you'll also get a, a link on our website that takes people to your website. And um, uh, what was I gonna say? I can't remember. Anywho, the information is there if you're interested and we would appreciate it. Um, also, if you're watching right now, we would appreciate it if you would share this live on your Facebook page so that we can get the word out about our show. Um, and remember, this is an interactive show. If you want to comment or if you have something you want us to answer, please feel free to put that in the comment section of the Paranormal Warehouse, and hopefully we can see them all. Um, yeah. My dog is snoring. I if you can hear that, <laughs> like loud. Uh, before we get into today's episode, though, I wanted to... My dog was looking in the window a minute ago. Oh. You still need you still need to put something spooky in that window oh, yeah. and make it look kind of creepy. Usually the kids are walking past doing that. Um, Jenna is asking if someone can tell me more about this. I don't know if you're referring to our show, Jenna, um, or the show before. But... We uh, basically, we go to locations that are extremely remote and out of the way, um, places that you've never really heard of before. And we tell you the story and the history behind that location. And we also give you our, the paranormal evidence that we captured while there. We do go to some places that you've heard of and um, a lot of investigators are familiar with, but uh, most of our investigations are in pretty remote places that no one would ever expect paranormal activity to be at. Plus they kind of gotta be close to us. Yeah, and it's kind of it's kind of fun because I feel like a lot of groups are just going to the same place over and over and over. And as much as I love those places, like Wa Waverly Hills, for example, it's an amazing location and I would love to do an investigation there, but I've heard all the stories, I've seen all the pictures. So we're trying to bring something new in that maybe you haven't ever seen before. Um, so that's a little bit about us. Uh, Jennifer says, hello. Thank you, Jennifer. Autumn says, it's 2020, anything could happen. That's for sure. Um, Boy, we've fact, experienced that. <laughs> in fact, I was watching the Alien Con um, webinar yesterday while I was working and it was very interesting. If you get a chance to, if they, put that on um, for you to go back and view. I highly recommend it. It was, I don't even know how to explain it, but at the very end they were like, hey, you never know what October will bring. I mean, they could show up and take over 2020. We don't know, but. Um, what, what more could go wrong? <laughs> yeah, it was really, good. it was really interesting. I really enjoyed it. And they did one a couple of weeks ago about uh, Superhuman, which is a, a movie that, um, oh, I can't remember her name now, but she put out, you can go to superhuman.com, I believe. You can also go to aliencon.com and get that information. But <clears throat> the movie was about um, parapsychology, the stuff that I'm studying right now for parapsychology, and I was fascinated by it. And um, I suggest everybody, if you're looking for something new, uh, go back and watch those webinars and watch the movie Superhuman. It was really interesting. So that brings us to today's episode. Um, we are going to talk about Kay's Cross. If any of you have ever heard of that before. Um, if you're from the area, you'll know probably a little bit about it. Um, but if you're not from this area, you may not have heard about it other than Ghost Adventures did do an investigation out there. Um, I don't know that they captured anything cool, but, and they didn't tell all of the story about it. <clears throat> so we're gonna tell you that tonight. Um, I was actually recommended this place to investigate by Central Utah Paranormal, who is one of uh, my Instagram friends and, 
the thing that I kind of like about having this paranormal family of friends, a group of friends that that we all follow each other is we can ask them questions and, hey, where should I go this weekend? I'm going to be up here or hey, is there anybody down in that area that you, you know, want to come with us to investigate? And we are able to talk about what we've done that works and good places to go and, and all that kind of stuff. And I really appreciate the support that I've gotten on Instagram from that. Um, it's always kind of fun. So I don't know if, how you heard about Case Cross, Michael. I was reading a book that was written by Lee Nelson. I like to read about the Spanish when they came up here looking for gold and their mines and their tunnels and their, their they did some bad things while they were here. They kind of enslaved the Indians to dig their gold out, which wasn't a good thing. Uh, there's a, in, in the book had a forward about the author and some guy asked him what he thought about this area. And the, the author had never heard of it before. And I think he's from the area. But in Duchesne County, there's a river called Rock Creek. And at the end of that river, there's a sheer rock face several hundred feet above the valley floor. And there is a cross in the side of that, that rock face, four feet high and three feet wide, made by the Spaniards to help them find their mines. I don't know how many years ago. I don't remember the time period, but it's quite a while ago before it was settled. And so I, I wanted to see that rock, that cross for myself. So I spent a bunch of time looking on Google Earth and Google itself trying to find this cross, but I could not find anything about it. But the one thing that did come up was this Kays Cross in Kaysville, Utah. And so that's kind of where I got started, where I got interested in that. I'd never heard of it before. And Kaysville, for anybody who doesn't know, is about 25 miles north of Salt Lake City. So that piqued her interest in it. This one day when we were together, Melissa says, I need to investigate Kay's Cross. And I concur. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, and we, we actually got online to kind of see what the history of the place was. And um, a lot of it is false. So don't believe everything you read out there. But we're going to tell you the, the true story behind Kay's Cross. And then we'll tell you some of the rumors that have gone on about it but <clears throat> anyway sorry my voice always gets so, dry yeah real quick we are trying to find case cross and oh, we yeah. can find it on google earth and it gave us kind of the coordinates and we drove to where it was near and it's a little hollow in the middle of this subdivision and we drove all the way around it. How many times? Two or three times? At least. We just could not figure out a way to get in there. There wasn't any roads down in. We did see one place there was a cross made out of styrofoam. And I'm thinking, man, I hope that's not it. Yeah. Because that'd be disappointing. But there's so many homes around it. But there's this little hollow. And once you climb down the side of there, you have no idea. That there's anybody around it looks like you're alone for miles and miles and that hollow kind of extends up through just a small canyon up into the mountains where animals can come down through there mountain lions you said they had wol wolves didn't he wolves? i almost said tigers but that's not <laughs> i don't think there's tigers mountain lions and even one account said dogmen mm -hmm. do you remember that yeah I um know. i think they also mentioned that on um ghost adventures did they so anyway it's once you get down there you would not know that there is civilization around you you don't hear a thing you can't see anything it's so thick and wooded pretty creepy little area anyway go ahead mm -hmm. um i was gonna say hello to graham from montana thank you for chiming in and um tracy thank you for sharing i don't know if i already said that I get nervous and my voice gets dry and I don't remember who I've thanked. But anyway, so thanks for tuning in, guys. We appreciate that. Um, so there are a lot of, like we said, there are a lot of different versions surrounding Kay's Cross. Um, and what we do know for sure to be true is that it was built in 1946 
it's big. It was roughly, it was big. It was roughly 20 feet high by 13 feet wide, and it was built for a cult leader named Krishna Venta. He performed religious ceremonies and sermons there on the property. And I'm going to show you a picture of what it looks like real quick, or what it did look like. It used to look like. Yep. Maybe... That's what it looked like in 1946 when it was built. Um, and I, it'd be nice to have a reference, you know, and have somebody standing next to it so you can see how big it is, but it was pretty big. I mean, it's 20 feet under high. That cross. Yeah, 20 feet high Definitely. is pretty big. Yeah. Um, Krishna Venta, whose real name was Francis Penkovic, Penkovic, I bet is how you say it, but I'm not positive. He was a religious cult leader who started to gain popularity when he established his own religion in 1948. He was a Jewish immigrant from Romania who also served in the United States Army during World War II. <clears throat> his wife was born in Utah, and uh, which is why they were actually here in Utah living when this cross was built. Um, in 1944, he divorced his first wife and married a secretary whom he'd been having an affair with. He, they were living at Salt Lake City at the time, and he traveled through the state of Utah as a lecturer hall minister. Um, following his lectures, he did the lectures for free, but then he also offered private classes to people in those lectures who wanted to learn more, and he charged $50 a person for those. And that is how he gained his popularity and followers throughout Utah. <clears throat> One of them was Merlin Kingston and his brother who offered to build the cross on their land, um, their land so that he could hold some outdoor lectures um, and stuff. And this is their land was Kay's, is known as Kay's Hollow, and that's where the cross is, was built. Um, it's, they, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. I, I thought it was interesting that they built it way down inside, down below from all the houses. It was a fair little walk to get down to them mm -hmm. in kind of a mysterious spot. So, I mean, I, mean, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know what it looked like back in 1940. I guess their house was near there, though, wasn't it, before it burned down? Mm -hmm. There's a house on the property. That's true. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. Um, they built the, the cross according to the plans that Krishna had drawn. These plans included a K at the top of the cross, which stood for kingdom. Um, a lot of people think it stands for K, but it's kingdom. And then parts of the cross had glass on them that would hold Krishna's scriptures and his important documents and stuff. Um, and then I was going to show a picture of the newspaper article there were, I found a newspaper article that showed him um, trying to well he was basically just advertising his uh, lectures and this one was actually done oops can you see that yep at the he was doing a lecture at the Ben Loman hotel, which I thought was interesting because the Ben Loman Hotel is rumored to be haunted. Um, I, from what I understand, it's in Ogden, Utah, and there was a lot of uh, mobster activity in Ogden back in the day. And so there are some stories about mobster related activity there in that hotel and um, some suicides and stuff that happened. But that's one place that I would also like to go investigate. But I understand it's actually um, apartments now. So I don't know if we can do that, but that was one of the newspaper articles. Um, <clears throat> he left Utah in 1947 and he moved to Box Canyon in California where he started his religion. Krishna states, I may as well say it, I am Christ. He claimed to have been born on another planet named Neophrates, I think is how you say it. Um, that was about 240,000 years ago that he claimed to have lived there. According to Krishna, the planet occupied the same orbit as Earth and was humanity's first home. Once the planet became uninhabitable, rocket ships carried the people from this planet to colonize the dark planet that would become known as Earth. He was chosen, chosen to be the leader and manifest himself as Krishnaventa. 
Hirschness started the foundation of the World Organization, which first, first gained national exposure in 1949 when the members offered to aid in victims of flight 897R, which crashed into the Simi Hills, Hills, killing 35 of the 48 people on board. They also volunteered for other humanitarian efforts, including fighting wildfires and offering food and shelter to the homeless. The members wore robes and they required um, all the followers to walk around shoeless. The males were required to grow beards and wear their hair long. And all the members were required to donate all their worldly possessions before joining. I was going to show you a picture of Krishna and some of the members that he is with. Um, this is him with the glasses. And, and this, I guess, was his daughter and his wife. And you can see what they wore and kind of what they looked like. Um, Kirshner prophesied of a destruction of mankind, which adapted well to the Cold War climate of the times. He told his followers that they would be tucked snugly away in a safe place as the world fought. Once the fight was over, he would take his rightful place as the world messiah, bringing equality, justice, and peace. Um, he was killed in California on December 10th, 1958 in a suicide bombing. It was instigated by two disgruntled former followers who had accused him of being a fraud and mishandling funds. They were also upset that Krishna had been intimate with their wives. Um, so he wasn't good dude. Uh, the explosion blew off the roof of the adjoining dormitory for children and touched, uh, it started a brush fire that swept over 150 acres across California. Two women or sorry, two children and a woman were severely burned following his death. Um, Sister Theedra and Sister Wally moved to Shasta Mountain, California, or Mount Shasta, sorry, California, where they um, claimed to still receive messages from him. And they kind of led the group for a little while. And then in 1968, Charles Manson and his group actually went to go live there. And this part of his group in, involved Susan Atkins, if you're familiar with Charles Manson and, and that story. Um, he tried to actually take over the group and be the leader after Krishna died, but the commune forced him out. And that's when he moved to the Spawn Movie Ranch. Um, the, eventually the memberships in the group declined. And it, in 1970, the group completely um, ceased to exist. So everybody had decided they didn't want to be part of the organization anymore after he died and um, they no longer no longer had the organization. So that's a little bit about the history of Kirshnaventa and how the cross was built. But there are a lot of rumors. Um, There's a also. lot of rumors that circulated in that area. It became a hot spot for urban legends. One of the rumors was that he, that he was a polygamist, that a polygamist lived there, and he got angry with his wives. He had seven wives, and so he killed them, and he buried all seven of them around that cross. Six of them laying down, and the seventh one he buried standing up at the base of the cross. And do you remember that walking— was that was actually the first story that I heard about it. You remember walking around that cross and there were definite holes in the ground? Yeah, there had been holes dug up around. Yeah, I used to work at a cemetery and I used to dig graves in high school. And part of my job as a, when I worked there was if a coffin or a grave collapsed, I would dig the grass up, put the dirt tamp the dirt back down, add some more dirt, and put the grass so that it was level. And so I got to know how a grave looked once it was collapsed or because the dirt's been dug up and you put it back in, you know, there's never enough. So it tends to settle, yeah. especially when it's soft. And there's a couple spots around there that look definitely like that. They did. And also to bury somebody standing up, if that's true, that's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. I dig six feet and I couldn't get out of the hole 
<laughs> I had to yeah. have a bucket or something. So true. that was a lot of work for seven people, true. whether that's true or not. But it does make an interesting story. I mean, you always, urban le- legends always form from something. So and I don't know. That seventh wife, supposedly he cut her heart out and hung it, put it inside one of those cases that they made on the side for the Holy Scripture. And somebody's broke into one of those and the legend says that they dug it and took it out. So I don't know. And then after he buried his wives, he hung himself from a nearby tree and did while we were there, the guy told us about that hanging in the tree, right? Yeah. It was pretty. Do you remember he, that? Yeah. But he said it was actually someone who had committed suicide. There. Oh, another person in the mm-hmm. same tree. Yeah. Hmm. Well, the tree that's the, trees everywhere, but the tree that, I mean, it looks like a creepy tree. Yeah. Um, it definitely stands out from all the others, but he said, um, yeah, he said that there was actually two suicides that happened on that property. One of them was a, a man who hung himself in that tree. And one of them was a, a soldier who had just returned from the war and was suffering from um, PTSD and he shot himself there. So I don't know if that's where the rumor about him hanging in the tree came from. I don't know. Maybe there was more than one. Possibly. Being in that area kind of gives you a little bit of a depressing. It definitely has a depressing atmosphere around it. Yes. Uh, Shaylee from Idaho says hello. Shaylee Remington? Yep. Mm. (laughs) Hi, Shaylee. Uh, and then we have uh, Cindy who says a lot of good information. Very interesting. Appreciate that. Uh, we've got Eric from California. Thanks for chiming in, Eric. And then we have Mary Graham who's given us a wink. Thanks. We like winks. So if I was a high school kid in that area at that time and I was bored and I knew about that place, I would definitely sneak on there as a kid. And, and it sounds like many, many, it became a hot spot for vandalizing, underage drinking, animal sacrifice, and dabbling in satanic rituals. There have been several skeletons found over there over the years. Um, so the owners have had to deal with trespassers and vandalism, which is not a good thing. But in those, back then, you could get access to that property through a cemetery and you got to be pretty bored to go through a cemetery to get to there. <laughs> Which is something we would have done. We, we would have done that because I, I had to work at night sometimes at the cemetery because I was screwing around during the day. And so I, I mean, did my work at night. We wouldn't have done the, the drinking and drugs no, and the satanic rituals, but, but we would have gone there for we'd sure. Gone to check it out, yeah. So it became such a problem for the family living there that the cross was destroyed. Well, they they... The cross was destroyed destroyed by an explosion in 1992. The blast obliterated the base and hurled 10-pound chunks of stone up to 80 feet in the air and was heard throughout the town around 10 o'clock at night. I'm going to show the picture of that real quick. Okay, but Um, I don't know how they know that because I don't think anybody was there. So I guess they're guessing. And nobody knows exactly why it was blown up, but many people think it was because he was tired of dealing with the trespassers and the problems they were having, but I think I don't think that deterred anybody. They're still coming to see it. They are. This is what it looked like when we were there. There wasn't a leaf on the tree. It was pretty spooky. Yeah, it was spooky. But even without the leaves being on the tree, like you couldn't see the houses around no. or or anything. You couldn't it even looked... hear traffic. No. It looked like you were out in the middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. But today, nobody knows for sure what happened. And just all that's happening is more and more rumors are circulating about what happened down there. But a lot of people think it was because of all the trespassers. They wanted to stop that. Or they wanted to stop the rituals and hoodoo voodoo stuff that was going on around there. But I don't think it worked because I think it just made it even more. Curiosity. More curiosity. 
um, when we went, we did have to get permission from the um, owners of the land. They're, they actually live there on the land. They have a small farm and orchard, it looked like. And so there is still a family that lives there. And they, um, I mean, imagine if somebody came onto your property and was messing around, especially doing, you know, crazy things and you wouldn't like it. So if you're ever going to go over there, please get permission from the family to be there. Is there There's a, a comment. comment? Is it about the energy? No, Cindy Para. Did anyone ever try to find or dig up the bodies? That's a good question. Not that I know of. What was the hole they were digging up then? They... They found uh, an animal, well, it was animal bones, I think, in a burlap sack of some sorts. Um, I think it had like feathers and, I mean, it was definitely a ritual type sacrifice that was done to that animal, that that's what they dug up and found. Um, I don't let, think. Go ahead. I don't think anybody, to my knowledge, dug them up. It didn't look like it, but it looked like when soft dirt gets smashed down, it does leave an impression in the ground. Uh, hopefully, nobody tried to dig that up. That's just yeah. I don't. Up. Yeah, I don't. Not that I know of any that anybody's ever tried to dig it up. But um, she also asked if there's a lot of energy there, and there was definitely there a, was lot, a of lot of energy, energy. there. Um, it felt dark. It did feel dark, and we. Um, so one of the family members that lives there he was actually a young man he took us on a tour and he was he was a little bit hesitant about talking about some of the history um but he did say that they still have a lot of paranormal activity that happens there um he told us that um he has actually seen a dark hooded figure on two occasions and he tried to talk to this dark figure one time he didn't tell us what was said or the conversation that was said, or even if the figure talked back to him. But, you know, we asked him, you know, who do you think this figure was? And he did believe it was Kirshna Venta. So um, a lot of the paranormal activity that's happening there, you know, is it due to, is Kirshna there? Is he protecting his cross? Is he kind of guarding the place? Or is a lot of it brought on from, those who are dabbling in in satanic rituals and and bringing it in is that's a good question but they have experienced and are still experiencing some of that activity and it's um it's not a uh, good activity it's definitely a negative energy and they they don't want it there and so they are really hesitant about letting people onto the property to do investigations and such um but they we do run a haunted attraction in Halloween, don't they? They do do a haunted attraction. It's one of the things that brings in some good money for their, um, for their family. And it's kind of a little, it, it helps satisfy the curiosity of those who, who want to get on and see the place, but um, want to do it the right way. So I think that's right. kind of why they, they do it. But um, I want to go in October and kind of walk through it and see if it feels any different than it felt during the day at night. Mm -hmm. He's, I mean, he did say that it definitely changes the vibe definitely changes at night and it's, it is really spooky. Um, the energy feels a lot heavier and more negative at night and they don't like to really go down there at all. Um, after it gets dark. Um, Don't blame them. Yeah. Uh, so we didn't necessarily do an investigation while we were there, although we wanted to. Um, there are just certain times and um, places where it's not appropriate. And this was one of them. Did you have something to add? No, it was just this guy's related down the yeah. line. And I just didn't, we didn't feel it appropriate. He was a relative. Yeah, a relative of the the two brothers that built the cross. And they're still there. This is the same family that owns it now, that owned it when the cross was built. 
Um, but we were, I mean, we did take our, our EMF reader um, and we took our um, EVP recorder. Nothing was captured on the EVP recorder. Uh, that was all gone through thoroughly, but we did get a spike on the EMF reader as we were walking through the front gate. I just saw an orb float past your face. Oh, really? <laughs> was it dust? One the, yeah, I'm sure. One of the readers asked where this was at, and they tuned in late. It's in Kaysville, Utah. It is. And like we said, there is a family that lives there. So if you're going to go check it out, please get permission from them before. And I'm sure they'll let you go on there as long as you um, get permission and you just want to make sure that you are doing it the right way. Respectfully. Yeah. But like I said, we did get a hit right as we were walking through the gate. I was going to show you the gate that's leading into the area. It's kind of a spooky gate. Yeah. And that was put there, from what I understand, that was put there by Kirshna Venta to kind of, it was like an opening to his kingdom. And I don't know exactly, but he was the one that had that installed. So that was us in the group that went on that particular adventure. Um, there's also a house on the property. Um, I remember asking him about this house because the rumor that I heard was that this house is where, I see your dog in the window again. <laughs> He's like, let me in, man. Um, the rumor Stand that- being by himself. <laughs> neither can mine. The rumor that we heard about, or that I heard about the house that's on the property was, it was the, the polygamist who killed his wives lived there and after he murdered his wives he blew up the house and then hung himself i don't know if any part of that is true um what the homeowner told us was that uh the people in the surrounding community were wary of the evil that was on that property everybody thought it was evil and the people that lived in that house must also be evil and so they either blew it up or burned it down. And that's what he told us. Um, and I'm gonna show you a picture of that house. What it looks like now, still pretty creepy. There's a, also a picture of a, the basement. Oh, that's the upstairs, but- um, Look at that rocking chair. Rocking chairs always make things creepier than than they are. There was also a basement. Especially when they're rocking. Yeah. Luckily, that one didn't rock while we were there. Although, I... I think I, I would have left. I, I don't know. I think I would have been excited. <laughs> we, it was the middle of the day. At night, maybe that's a different story. But that those are the... Oops. Those are the... Oh, I can do that. I didn't know I could do that. Can you see all those pictures as I flip yeah. through them? Cool. Yeah. Good to know. So there's the stairs to the basement. Um, another area i think that was the stairs that led back up and out the door but that was at the second level anyway yeah so we were able to go in and um walk through the house we did not get any readings walking through the house we did not get any readings over by the well if any of you have seen the ghost adventures episode i think they had it's been a while since i've seen it but they had some pretty interesting things happen by the well um, we didn't. Which but. is weird because the well wasn't nearly as old as. No, and I'm not. I'm not even sure if it's a real well. It's not a real well. If you look behind it, it's the creek runs past it, and the water they just dug kind of a. To me, it looked like they just. I mean, it's the well is only four feet deep. The water they just dug a little like ditch and put a pipe in it for the water to run into that hole. Mm -hmm. These. The brick around the well are just firing bricks, so it's that isn't nearly as old. Was it built for their? He didn't say whether it was built for their haunted attraction or not, but I almost wonder if it was because he did say that they put someone in there during the haunted attraction yeah. to jump out and scare people. But you can see there's a, I think that's supposed to be a Star of David. Um, 
spray painted on there. I think that's what that's supposed to be. And a lot of people will refer, you know, that's a, they think that's a satanic ritual or a satanic symbol. And so, you know, if you believe that and think that that's what that is there for, then you might get a little creeped out by the well. Um, I just, I mean, what I was saying though, was I don't think that was there the same time period as the cross was built. I don't think, I it think was that's either. why we didn't get any readings there. Yeah. Um, the only place that we got readings was um, as we passed through the gate. Um, Michelle says, I believe the basement had some stairs, a rocking chair, and some debris. It did, yeah. Um, nothing in the base. There wasn't anything in the basement other than the stairs that were left. Maybe a few. There was like pieces of um, there was like a fridge and a bathtub and a stove that were kind of strewn about the property. I mean, it looked like an explosion. It looked like it took off it. the half of the upstairs where I mean, the, the walls were completely gone. The ceiling, the roof was completely gone. And it almost looked like the, you know, the stove and fridge and bathtub just kind of flew and, and landed. It looked more like an explosion than a, and then fire, not just a fire. Yeah. Because it would have fallen down in on it, not landed everywhere. So, mm -hmm. so um, you know, the when he talked about the townspeople, you know, wanting to get rid of the people that live there because they thought they were evil, if they did try to bomb it or put an explosion on it, it wasn't, I don't think it was close enough to the cross that the cross could have done that. It was quite a, it was a little bit of a distance. Um, it was different times too, I believe. Yeah. So, and like I said, the homeowner was kind of leery about giving us all the details. Um, you know, this is their private life. And so I get it. I Super nice are, guy though. Yeah, really nice guy, really nice family that works the farm there and, and the orchards. So like, like we said before, just be respectful of this location if you find it and do decide you wanna go explore it. Um, we, we really would like to go back at night um, and investigate and see, see how different the energy and the atmosphere changes at night versus the day. I mean, it, it's always creepier at night, no matter what you do, when it's dark and you can't see. My driveway is creepier at night. So. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, and, you know, like, they, like Mike said before, there are rumors of dog men um, that roam the property. <clears throat> that come or up the, the cross canyon. is that i understood it right yeah there was also a rumors of a and they use the word spectral woman who floats around and at night you can occasionally see her and sometimes during phases of the moon which i don't understand all that it glows green. it brings in more energy and yeah mm -hmm. So, so that maybe that's, um, you know, the, the root that could have been brought on by, I mean, the rumor about the polygamist who killed his wives, a lot of people think that that ghost is one of his wives. Um, but if that rumor is not true, it still could be Kirshna's wife or one of the women that he had affairs with. Um, you know, who knows if I'm sure they're haunted by the place. I don't, you know, if he's sticking around there, he's still there. One of the accounts was if you touched it when it was green, you'd burn you. I read that on one of the websites. And unfortunately, we couldn't verify if that was true because it wasn't green while we were there. <laughs> Darn it. Nothing was green while we were there. <laughs> Nothing. 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 Everything was dead. That's why it looks so creepy, I think. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we, we talked about... Uh, you know, if you, you're at a location where you really want to do an investigation, but it's not appropriate or is there another comment, Lauren? Um, not that I can see. I have to keep refreshing in mind to see any of the comments. Um, but we, you know, we talked about what, what do you do? Like, how can you still kind of collect um, some paranormal evidence if you want to really investigate that property. And we, we did take our EMF reader. So 
you know, getting that spike as we were walking past the gate was a little odd. There's no electricity. There's nothing there that would set it off. Um, being able to talk to the homeowner and get some of his um, paranormal experiences were really interesting. Um, and they did, he did corroborate a lot of his experiences with what other people have said about the place. Um, he didn't, he sounded pretty, pretty genuine when he talked about it. Yeah, and the fact that he wouldn't disclose everything makes me think that, you know, he was a pretty honest guy, and he was only going to tell us what um, he knew to be true, and he wasn't mm -hmm. going to he feed wasn't, into the rumors. Yeah, he wasn't trying to embellish the story to sell tickets into his no. attraction there, so... Um, but, you know, what are some of your ideas for uh, going to a place where you're not able to do a full investigation and get the activity or the, you know, get the paranormal evidence that you want to capture? Um, besides me taking in the EMF and the uh, EVP recorder, is there, do you have any other suggestions? You know, one thing that I really like to do on any investigation is just sit in the location quietly with my eyes closed and listen and get a feel for what's around me, uh, the noises that I hear, you know, what's normal, what probably isn't normal. Um, is there anything that stands out as you're sitting there feeling and, and, and listening? While we were there and we were listening, did was there animal sounds? I don't recall hearing a single sound of any kind. Uh-uh. And maybe it was the time of the year. What did we go? There were no crickets or nothing that I that I remember. I might be wrong, but I don't remember any bird chirping or. I mean, it would have been quiet. early spring, and you'd think there would at least be birds chirping. It was pretty quiet. Yeah, it was very quiet. Especially I mean, to be in in that kind of part of town where there's mm -hmm. so many houses around. Anyway. Definitely, but you know, just I. You can you can definitely feel a different energy there than you feel when you walk up the hill and are back to, you know, the road. Sometimes it's the absence of sounds or temperature or things that you need to look for too. You know, the there other should be something, and there's not. Yeah, and the other question we had, and this has happened on several locations. Um, is like we said, is the paranormal activity there due to Kirshnaventa and his followers? Um, is he watching over the place? You know, is, is he still there trying to protect the cross or whatever? Or is a lot of it brought on by those who um, have dabbled in the satanic rituals that have been taking place there? And there, there's obvious symbols of that um, everywhere. There's you know they've been they've spray painted on the trees and the cross and the buildings they're like like we said they found lots of different animal um remains that definitely had a ritual done to them of some sort and we've been to other activities or, or sorry other locations where we haven't been to activities <laughs> words are really hard for me um the train of thought is hard for me too um, but we've been to a lot of different locations where there wasn't necessarily a death that occurred. There wasn't necessarily a traumatic event, um, but there was a lot of paranormal activity. And I think a lot of times it is brought in by people who, who bring it in, who try to perform satanic rituals or who just bring in a negative energy while they're there because they want it to be there or they want to have some sort of um, experience while they're there. And I think a lot of it is brought in, honestly. What do you think about that? If you're talking about that place that was by our house, that we used to, beautiful location, but a lot of crap happened there. And on Friday and Saturday nights, we'd see the cops going up there and we'd see a lot of weird stuff going on. So I... I think of people are dabbling with it and bringing it with them, looking for it, which I don't like. We shouldn't look for it, but sometimes it's there regardless. I that is a good question. You mean I? I mean I don't. I want to find answers to 
the paranormal activity that happens in these locations and it has happened to me but and I you know I want to and I want to find and seek answers to uh the spirit world and what happens after we die but I definitely don't want to dabble in anything that would that's put, probably a pretty fine line right there yeah I mean I definitely would never do that but but I think a lot of it is your intention mm -hmm. you know we saw evidence of rituals up in that area, the animals, the sacrifice, assuming it's a sacrifice, you know, the candles, the, the stars, the pentagrams, that kind of stuff. So they're definitely trying to invite not just a spirit, but a certain specific spirit. And I think that's where a lot of that is people definitely asking for it. I think a lot of the stigma around paranormal investigation comes from that too, because, uh, you know, I mean, it's spooky when you come across something that, you know, that you're, you don't know what it is and it, it spooks you, but, but spooking and, and having that negative feeling is, are two different things. And, mm -hmm. um, not every paranormal investigator out there is trying to find that and look for that. And I think you need to be really careful when you are going to these locations where that has happened, or if you think that's what you want to do, you may might want to think twice about it. That's just my opinion, but we uh, only have about four minutes left. So um, anything else you want to add to that story? No, I just enjoyed a, an adventure I, I never heard of and I really, yeah, I really enjoyed that location. It was one of the, one of our top locations that I've been to. Um, and to be able to hear the real story behind it was also extremely interesting because I had never heard that until I did some research on it. And I also really enjoyed talking to the, the owners of the property and getting their um, take on the place and the real stories that happened there and, and some of the activity that they're still having, you know, I personally, if I saw a man in a hooded robe, would never try to talk to him. I don't think I would either. But so he was pretty brave to do that. And I think he basically wanted to just find out who he was and why he was there. Because he'd seen him multiple times. Mm -hmm. At I, least twice. Yeah. I thought it was multiple. And he's finally asked him what Maybe, who he was. You could be correct. Because he'd seen him enough. Mm -hmm. At least that's what I understood. But. Yeah, so we want to just give a shout out to uh, one of the causes that we support um, here on Destination Mystery, and it's your, your mental health. Um, uh, my background, like I said before, is in human development and psychology, and uh, taking care of your mental health is an extremely important thing to do. Um, we want to just let you know of a, a website that you can go to. It's suicidepreventionlifeline.org. You can... Uh, if you don't want to talk to somebody on the phone, you can chat um, with someone on that website address. You can also call the hotline at 1-800-273-8255. Um, sorry, yeah, no, that's correct. The web, web address is actually su suicidepreventionlifeline.org. There are a lot of different services on there that can be useful for, for you. Um, taking care of yourself and being able to talk to someone is, is extremely important to help you work through some issues and um, some things that you're having. And, and just to let you know that you're not alone, that um, there are a lot of people out here who want to help you and make sure that you're um, doing okay. So please don't hesitate to use these resources that are available to you if you need them. Uh, next week, we are going to talk about an abandoned factory that we explored. Um, we did do a paranormal investigation at this factory and came up with some evidence that we found crazy. Like, I, I always go into a place thinking, well, I hope we get something. And then if we get something that was actually relevant to that location, it's always so cool to me. Speaking so, of mental health, this is why I like these adventures. It helps my mental health. I have something yes. to look forward to. A good adventure. Get out and explore. Um, get out in nature. Get out and do all these fun things. And I promise you, you'll feel better, um, especially when you're cooped up for COVID all the time. So get outside, explore, find some fun things to do, and squatch on. We'll see you next week. See you next week. <laughs>